like being a part of everyone's holiday tradition. We wanted to really challenge ourselves to find works that hadn't been seen in a very long time. You know, sometimes the small moments turn into the big moments. Today on Spotlight, we'll take you inside an iconic holiday tradition continuing at the park. Plus, see a world-class collection of German art from the last 200 years. And then a witty and eclectic look at life in the Deep South. But first, a special group giving families dealing with cancer one great day. It's Sunday and you're watching Spotlight. So, you know, you think I'd be used to it at this point, but every time I see all these people converge, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm almost awestruck. You know, it's, it's almost leaves me speechless at times. Laura found her lump on October 2nd of 2013. As the seasons change, one date reminds friends and family of a sense of loss, yet inspires a community. As Tom Wiley's wife began a two-year battle with breast cancer, Laura had many bad days. But on this day, December 5th, she had a good one. There she was. She was making pancakes. And the first thing that she told me was, was how great she felt. The family felt normal for the first time in months. They put up Christmas decorations and saw the lights in Tillis Park. We didn't talk about cancer. You know, we just, uh, just had this day full of small little moments. Laura died the next month. In the weeks that followed, Tom reflected on that one great day. So that's when I started coming up with the idea of giving families whose lives have been affected by cancer just a day of moments, a day of experiences. Joined by friends, Wiley launched the December 5th Fund, a not-for-profit group aimed at giving families dealing with cancer one good day. I knew Tom wanted to do something to honor Lara, so when he brought this idea around, yes, yeah. I just knew it was the right thing to do. Each great day looks different. In this scenario, an army of volunteers do a massive cleanup, reorganization, and needed repairs inside and outside a home in De Pere, while the family enjoys a day out. Right now what we're doing is we are taking everything out of the cabinets, sort of reorganizing, putting like things together, making more space too for other things. We'll be doing all the dishes as well, getting all the clean dishes put away so that they just come back to a sparkling kitchen. Sometimes the house fix part is a surprise, but in this case, the group met with a mom who is sick, who had some things she wanted done for her family, like a basketball hoop for her children. And this was her vision of what she wanted, and so it's just really inspiring and just really makes you feel good that you're just kind of taking some of those worries away from the mom. And I know that it's just you're so inundated with uh, the day-to-day -day requirements of that person that everything else falls down around you and living in you know a mess tends to wear on you mentally as well you know you feel better you come home to a nice house to the yard work as opposed to going oh great I've got to now go out and mow the lawn weed whack fix the gutter all of these things which aren't important to you because obviously the loved ones uh, wellness is more important but it's still something that you know oh, I need to do oh, I need so it, it removes that burden if only for a few uh, weeks months something like that many of these volunteers traveled the cancer journey with Tom and his family Jennifer Schaefer was one of Lara's closest friends when I lost best friend uh, I wanted to give back and help people and kind of help heal 
my heart. Beth Warman joined the volunteer crew after the December 5th fund helped a relative also battling breast cancer. It was super emotional. She was completely overwhelmed and it was very touching. It was, um, they, uh, came together and did this great day for her and her kids and it was it was great. Every family situation is unique and so is their special day out, which sometimes include behind the scenes tours at sporting events, movies, concerts and meals with friends. The idea to relieve the burdens back home stems from Wiley's personal situation as well. People would show up at his house to clean, do laundry and other tasks without being asked. Yeah, Jared hasn't fallen off the roof yet, so it's a good day. Yeah. When my wife was going through all this, I had the same kind of support, but I never asked for it. People would just show up to my house, they do the laundry, they clean the house, they do whatever they could to show support for us. And that's, uh, I mean, that's why we do this. In its first year, the December 5th fund gave a great day to seven families. Its supporters also do special events on December 5th, including random acts of kindness around the St. Louis area. It's a way, Tom says, to remember Laura and move forward in a way that spreads joy to families during a tumultuous time. And sometimes the small moments turn into the big moments. To learn more about the December 5th Fund, visit December5th.org. Follow HEC Media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Welcome to Winter Wonderland in beautiful Tillis Park here in St. Louis County. It's our annual holiday light display. Winter Wonderland is a, is a great team effort for us here at St. Louis County Parks. We've got 25 staff members that start all the way back in early October. It takes them about six weeks to set up the event. And then we've got wonderful volunteers and rangers that are even here throughout the whole holiday light display. We have over one and a half million lights throughout the park here in Tillis Park for Winter Wonderland. If you put all those extension cords together, it, it totals up to about 200 miles of cord. It should take you all the way from here to Springfield, Missouri. Winter Wonderland can be enjoyed in many different ways. You can drive through in a car, no reservations required, or we also have horse-drawn carriage rides, which are available through Metro Tix. With 1.5 million lights spread out over the course of about a mile, it takes you about 20 or 30 minutes to see the full light display. It's neat to have people come out and we have volunteer groups that will uh, help us each night and we make a contribution to each one of those and it's fun to hear from the volunteers. They've been coming here for as long as they can remember since they were a little kid. We like being a part of everyone's holiday tradition. By far the coolest part about the event for our staff, whether it's a maintenance worker or a park ranger or me as a recreation events coordinator is the kids and seeing the kids eyes light up and the oohs and ahs and pointing out what was their favorite part. I still remember from when I was a kid my favorite part being the, the deer that were out in the Lake of Blue Lights, which is still out there today. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. The title of the exhibition is Storm of Progress, German Art After 1800 from the St. Louis Art Museum. It was inspired by the writings of a noted and influential German Jewish cultural theorist and philosopher named Walter Benjamin. And he wrote about this idea of the storm of progress in an essay titled On the Concept of History, which he wrote in 1940, the year he died in the Holocaust. He coins the phrase in an anecdote in which he's trying to describe how history works through the image of a work by Paul Clay, which is not in the exhibition. But in this particular famous drawing, there is an angel. And Benjamin imagines the angel as the angel of history, who is blown by a strong wind coming out of the gates of paradise. And the wind is so strong that he's blown backwards into the future. And it's a wind that brings the promise of a better future, but it's also a wind that brings the prospect for destruction and annihilation. And as we were thinking about this exhibition and considering how these works really illuminate 
aspects of German political history and its tragic political history. We thought this idea, this image of a storm that's a natural event, one that's associated with destruction, and then paired with this term of progress, something that's associated with culture and with civilization and with improvement. And when you put these two terms together, a storm of progress, it captures that contradiction that we see in a lot of German art. This exhibition came out of the conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic. We had an international loan show that was canceled because of international travel and freight being basically impossible from March until you know, the summer. And so we really had to come up with something quickly. And in museum time, six to eight months is very quick, actually. So we turned to the strength of the St. Louis Art Museum collection, which is its incredible depth in German art. One of the things we focused on is looking at German art across a broader time period than we had at the museum before. Normally these histories start around 1900, turn of the century, covering 100 years of art which alone would have been a lot. But we open in 1800, which is a momentous period in German history because it marks the fall of the Holy Roman Empire. At a time when France, for instance, was undergoing the French Revolution and welcoming democracy, Germany was really a mosaic of independent and autonomous states, each one with its own artists, some of them competing against each other. It created a very dynamic art environment, and you see that in the works that are on display. Even though we're covering 200 years of German history in this exhibition, we only had space for 100, 120 objects. So we had to be very selective and we had a lot to choose from. Here at the museum, we have a fantastic selection of works on view in our permanent collection galleries. And importantly, those works are still there. But we wanted to really challenge ourselves to go into storage and to find works that hadn't been seen in a very long time and that could uniquely tell this story about German art and German history in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So the St. Louis Art Museum's collection of German art across time is really unique, but the post-war works are very special. And it's in part because of depth in certain artists' work and then also just the breadth of both medium and type of artist working. So we have really strong holdings in Gerhard Richter, one of the most important post-war German artists, including his absolute masterpiece, which is Betty. We also have a lot of depth in a German artist named Sigmar Polka, and really just wonderful works in the show that range from photographs and lithographs all the way to one of his most spectacular 1980s paintings. The reason why the museum has such a strong collection of 20th century German art has to do with the history of major gifts made to the museum in the relatively recent period. The story started in a real way in 1983 when St. Louis businessman Morton D. May gave thousands of works of art to the museum as part of his bequest. And that formed the kernel of what is now a very significant collection of works so that May bequest, which completely transformed our holdings of modern art, inspired other collectors and other donors to build their own collections of post-war German art, the art that followed this sort of expressionist period, and then later to gift it to the museum. One of the things that's been really fantastic about this exhibition is that we've made it free because we want to share the museum as a space and this really spectacular collection with the people of St. Louis and visitors who come to the city. But if you don't feel comfortable getting a time ticket online for a slot to see the show, we also have an expanded selection of online guides. We have a really nice audio guide that features many curators from the museum talking about a wide variety of works across media from 1800 all the way to the present. On display through February 28th, 2021. Visit slam.org for more info. Enjoy the sounds of the season later on Spotlight. When President Donald Trump was infected with COVID-19, he was given an experimental monoclonal antibody therapy as part of his treatment regimen. 
Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis is involved in varied clinical trials using two different monoclonal antibody therapies. The one given to President Trump from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and the Eli Lilly treatment recently granted emergency use authorization from the FDA. Monoclonal antibodies are made in a lab to mimic the body's natural antibodies, harnessing the immune system to fight off COVID-19. In St. Louis, Dr. Rachel Presti oversees clinical trials as the medical director of the Infectious Diseases Clinical Research Unit. They've figured out a way to, to grow up an individual B cell that makes a single antibody. So it's a clone and everything um, about it is identical. And then they can take those individual antibodies and they can figure out which one is the best antibody to bind or to um, target a certain immune response or so on against a given germ. Dr. Presti is principal investigator of the clinical trial for the Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody therapy. In this study, this is a demonstration of the infusions given to COVID-19 outpatients. Presti said providing the Eli Lilly infusions is not so much a trial as it's considered clinical care as it now moves into a phase three trial. That's because the FDA granted emergency use authorization for this IV treatment. Emergency use is meant for adults and children over age 12 with mild to moderate illness who are at high risk of getting worse needing hospitalization. Dr. Presti says preliminary studies show no benefit for hospitalized patients with severe cases. Clinical trials for the Regeneron therapy are ongoing. To look to see if monoclonal antibodies that are directed against um, SARS-CoV-2 will prevent progression of disease um, and help people get better faster when they're in the hospital, so when they're hospitalized with COVID. In another clinical trial at WashU, investigators hope to discover if the Regeneron therapy would help household members of COVID-19 positive patients. We are looking to see if household contacts, if given an injection of uh, like a shot with monoclonal antibodies, if it prevents them from actually getting COVID, and if they do get it, if it prevents them from getting very sick with it. Presti says enrollment with household members is more difficult because the window was very short. But she says the research is advancing and overall they are having success enrolling people in the St. Louis region for clinical trials in the fight against COVID-19. HEC has been bringing you positive programming and award-winning content for decades. Arts, education, culture, in-depth discussions, films, and more. All in one place, hecmedia.org. If you want to excite Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Rick Bragg, just get him talking about the South. I always thought it was hilarious that we called like our cities these names, like the Big Easy. There ain't nothing easy about New Orleans. If you slow down on a street corner in New Orleans, someone will run over you. He has lived all over the country and worked all over the world. But the Deep South is Rick Bragg's home. And he is sharing some of his homespun wit and wisdom in a new collection of essays and articles all about his life in the deep American South. I really haven't changed that much. I haven't improved at all, except that I have a slightly better pickup truck. In Where I Come From, Bragg explores everything from road trips and fire ants to pig's feet and Tupperware. But hidden under the humor is a nagging truth-telling. You know, being a, a writer and being Southern isn't exactly a big surprise. There have been some really great ones, uh, and I'm wondering if there's something that sort of binds them all together. I mean, Tennessee Williams, of course, we lay some claim to him up here in, in St. Louis, uh, but Truman Capote, Margaret Mitchell, Pat Conroy, Harper Lee, Rick Bragg. Uh, is there anything that you see as a common thread with all of these Southern writers? That's a boy, that's a $40 question right there. Some people say it's the pathos. They say that it's, it's the fact that so much has been lost here, even in winning. Uh, I mean, a lot of Southerners like me, we don't want to return to the bad old days. 
we don't want to turn back time. We don't want to go back to the racisms and the meanness and the classisms of, of the old South. I sort of get the sense from the book, although there's a lot of joyous passages in it and fun stories like we've been sharing, that there's a sense that, that you're mourning something a little bit about the South. You know, Southerners are all full of this Gothic angst, but you can kind of hear the bridges falling down here. You can hear the bridges falling. You can hear the, the, the hands of some kind of ancient, rusty courthouse clock clang into place, striking midnight. My mother is 83, and she has survived more than I can even say. And, uh, um, you know, they prop up, women like her prop up sorry men. Um, fight to give their children a chance, drag cotton sacks. Every time I pass a cotton field, my mother will, will have me slow down because she thinks they're beautiful. And I look at her and I'll say, but didn't you almost kill yourself in one of those? And it doesn't matter. It's still beautiful to her. I'm so glad to hear that she's still with you, because I wasn't sure how old some of those essays were, and she's one of the great characters of the book. One of my great ambitions was to was to have people see the value in my mama. You know, and, and I think we pulled that off. I ought to take a day off. Sorry to hear that you feel that so much of the Southern culture is disappearing, but thankful at least that you've taken the time to record it and document it all these years and put it into great books like Where I Come From, Stories from the Deep South. It's a wonderful read, and it's been really wonderful talking to you, Rick. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Appreciate the questions. I try not to be one of those Southerners who waste whole days lamenting things that now lie discarded beside a road will never travel again. I try, but I miss stadium hot dogs and wax paper. I miss real country music with steel guitar and soul. I miss old growth forests in the shade of the stone mountains. I miss the white dunes of the Gulf buried now under miles of concrete. I miss tea cakes, the kind my grandmother made. I miss the amazing rhythm Macy. I miss old barns telling me to see rock city. And I miss Tupperware. Text BRAG to 31996 to watch the full interview and hear the very odd question one of his readers once asked him. You can also download our Talking with Authors podcast. They are the best-selling authors and all of your favorite genres. For in-depth, one-on-one interviews, go to hecmedia.org. I'm dreaming of a wife. Christmas, just like the ones I used to know, where the treetops glisten and children listen to hear sleigh bells in the snow. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. With every Christmas card I write May your days be merry and bright And may all your Christmases be white
treetops glisten earn. Children listen to hear sleigh bells in the snow. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas with every Christmas card I write. May your days be merry and bright. And may all your Christmases, all your Christmases, all your Christmases be. Head to hecmedia.org. Next week, Santa and Coca Cola Why the Story Began in St. Louis. Plus, a behind the scenes account from Jill Wine Banks about her time as a Watergate special prosecutor. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9 30 a.m. on KPLR 11.